Hello everyone, my name is Juliette Milagro Mazzi, okay? And I'm Sarah King. And today we'll be talking about government and transparency in Uncatania and Los Sanchez, our respective EWB locations. So to begin, we wanted to discuss why we chose our topic. In Los Sanchez, the issue of corruption in government and the lack of transparency had become increasingly clear as we went through the process of building in the Dominican Republic, first with the building of an unexpected tank after a year of work, and now with us seeking a new permit for a well. Um, and in Mukatani, this matters for similar reasons. And also, it's just important to know about the leadership in a country and to know how small communities like Mukatani are affected by um, lack of transparency in government. So we'll start off by going to the Dominican Republic. Here I've laid out a very brief history, which essentially goes through the colonial period that the Dominican Republic underwent and highlights the fact that it was very unstable for long periods of its history due to takeovers by Haiti, fights for independence and American interventions. But perhaps the most important factor in shaping the history of the Dominican Republic was Rafael Trujillo, a dictator who ruled the country for almost 30 years. And while he was hailed for his economic development of the country, currently the DR is one of the richest countries, and not just the Caribbean, but all of Latin America, he also was responsible for bringing about this new phase of nepotism and accepting of corruption because he held down people's rights and almost made it impossible for people to express their individual liberties. Rafael Trujillo was eventually assassinated in the 1960s, at which point the United States divided to intervene militarily once again. And after the United States left after this intervention, the Dominican Republic entered a new phase of more modern and more stable politics. However, Joaquin Balaguer, who was known worldwide as a political mastermind, was able to manipulate politics within the DR to make sure that he stayed in power for stretches at a time. Eventually, Balaguer too fell from power as the 2000s approach, and the Dominican Liberation Party, which has now ruled the DR for more than 16 of the last 20 years, came to the forefront. The current president of the Dominican Republic, Danilo Medina, is from the DLP, and he's been president since 2012. According to one source, he's the most loved president in all of Latin America. However, it's not necessarily because people trust him, but more because of things like building schools in Constanza, where he's trying to gain their appreciation without really having their trust. Yet Danilo Medina is far from the only politician that Dominicans do not trust. In fact, in 2016, Transparency International, an international watchdog organization, ranked 176 countries based on how transparent they were. The DR came in nearly at the bottom at 120. Yet, this isn't surprising, considering the DR is still developing in many ways, especially its government institutions. Yet, what is critical to note, especially for us, is the fact that the DR is corrupt in very specific ways. For example, there's unlegislated protectionism. What this means is that people who are inside inner circles in the DR get better contracts and better deals than organizations such as EWB from who are foreigners from outside. Additionally, it seems that scandals are more likely to go unpunished in the DR than other, say, Latin American countries. For example, in spring of 2017, the Odebrecht scandal shocked Latin America. Yet, while in countries such as Panama and Costa Rica, top-level officials were sent to jail, and D the DR, the highest-ranking official who was sent to jail was Victor Diaz Rua, the treasurer of the DLP, who isn't very high-ranking considering that it's thought that people even such as Danilo Medina was involved in the scandal. Yet, this has very large ramifications because it means that projects such as roads and bridges can be overpriced by three times and taxpayers will receive no amnesty or no justice as a result. So we have to ask ourselves, why is the DR, the country where we have chosen to place our project, so opaque? The reason can largely be attributed to Rafael Trujillo and his 30 years reign of nepotism 
and just making things in the Dominican Republic difficult for both the government and the people. In addition to this, there's only one large city, Santo Domingo, which means that elites in this one city can collude with each other and don't have to face or worry about elites in another neighboring city who might challenge them. In addition to this, family ties have been historically very important to the Dominican Republic. In fact, in many cases, if one brother is to give his sister a job that she doesn't necessarily deserve, it's viewed as a good thing because it shows loyalty to family, even if it's at the disadvantage of the rest of the country, which is a high evidence of this high level of tolerance for nepotism. And finally, when the DLP has been in charge of the Dominican Republic for the last 16 out of 20 years and are in each three branches of government, it's very hard for checks and balances to work, which again contributes to this corruption. But of course there have been attempts to curb this corruption. For example, in 2010, there was a citizen observatory for implementation, which was supported by society groups from 14 different sectors of the government, as well as the then president, President Leonel Fernandez. Now this was effective because it had support from such a wide range of people, as well as actors at the top. It meant that people were able to reduce costs on things such as medicine, but it's also, uh, and it also shows hope for the Dominican Republic that things can change. Yet, while things can change, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they have. In fact, just last summer, the Dominican Republic experienced the Marcha Verde, where hundreds of thousands of Dominicans took to the streets to march against being victims of corruption and against the lack of transparency within the DR. This March of Verde had a largely environmental tinge, as it was not just calling for more accountability, but also for greater protection of the environment and for more protection of those people who had lobbied to protect the environment who had come to untimely murders or deaths without explanation. So how does Los Sanchez, the place where we are working, fit into all of this? Well, geographically, Los Sanchez is located in Direo, which is a town of the municipal district of Constanza, and Constanza is a city itself within the province of La Vega, which is one out of 31. La Vega is one of the first of five original provinces that was created in the Dominican Republic, which means that it's historically very old. It has a lot of influence from Rafael Trujillo, who was actually a person who settled it, bringing in Spanish, Japanese, and Hungarian immigrants. Now, to understand better the government in Constanza, it's important to see how they react to the national government and how that affects the people in smaller cities such as Los Sanchez and Tireo. For example, Valle Nuevo National Park, which is a town in the northern part of Constanza, is a place where 400 plus farming families have been for the past 70 years. Yet, at the request of the national government, the government in Constanza was willing to completely evacuate them. In addition to this, there have been issues with permits and funding, and people in Los Angeles often have to go to Constanza when they need help, but often the government in Constanza is more aligned with the national government. Importantly, we have to understand how Los Sanchez governs itself as well. The Junta de Vecinos, whom we work on the ground with when we are in Los Sanchez, is led by Marcos Reyes. This organization is rather informal in the fact that it doesn't necessarily answer to a higher body. It doesn't necessarily take in the following um, regulations that you'd expect of a government organization, but it does have the community's respect and is able to point important positions. The Asociación de Alta la Mercedes was recently created, and it is more organized in the fact that it checks IDs, and it's also the government that we're working with in seeking a wall appointment. In addition to this, there's a lot of other local political syndicates that kind of form up as people feel comfortable with them forming, and they are getting more active as the elections draw closer, which is important because we have to keep an eye out for that. So now that we understand all of these facts about transparency and government and Los Sanchez and the DR, how are we going to use it? Well, the best way to use it is by continuing to learn more information. So moving forward, we need to better understand the importance of family ties on both a national and local level. Additionally, we need to see how that factors into transparency issues and better understand the different factors at play when it comes to corruption in government, particularly as it relates to our own projects. Next, 
keeping track of the political climate in not just Los Sanchez, but the wider Constanza and La Vega area will be critical in order to make sure that politicians and their platforms do not run against what we are trying to achieve in Los Sanchez. Finally, getting to know officials in Tireo and Constanza can only be to our benefit. They can answer questions that we might not be able to find the answers to online or through more local sources, and they can additionally provide aid in times of need. So, that's government and transparency in Los Sanchez and the DR. Let's see how the same concepts apply in Tanzania. So, as we will see, Tanzania and the Dominican Republic face very similar issues with the lack of transparency in government. The issues of corruption seen in Tanzania, however, are far more broad and less influenced by family ties like they are in the Dominican Republic. Before getting into the opacity of its government, I will briefly briefly set the scene for Tanzania. Today, it is the United Republic of Tanzania, um, and that is basically a merger of mainland Tanzania and the island Zanzibar, which can be seen directly east of Tanzania. Um, Both of their parties merged together in this union to form the Chama Chama Mapinduzi Party, which is the dominant party today. The current population is 55 million. Um, There are over 120 ethnicities. And the current population of the Dodoma region is 2 million, approximately. And the Dodoma region can be seen here on the map. That is where Mugatani is located. The constitution that was created in 1977 was actually amended in 1984 to create a Bill of Rights, which is important for us to know. Um, Additionally, as far as the executive branch goes, there is a president, Uh, his cabinet of ministers, and the prime minister, who leads over the cabinet and is the vice president of the country. There is a unicameral national assembly, um, and these members are re-elected directly every five years, Um, but some seats are also reserved for women and presidential nominees. Locally, the government is divided into regional, district, division, and ward levels. We can see the regional levels on the map, but the other levels are much smaller. Uh, The the district that Mugatani is in is actually the Congo district, and that's where they get their funds for their school. Um, there are also ambassadors in Mugatani, and each ambassador is responsible for 10 homes in the community, and when funds are needed, they will go to each of these homes and ask for funds. Before looking at the corruption that exists in Tanzanian government, I want to first talk about the laws that exist that prevent this. Um, The Prevention and Combating of Corruption Act is a very big act that has attempted to combat corruption, bribery, laundering, etc. Um, And it also created a bureau whose goal is to enforce these laws and to also educate society about the effects of corruption. Um, There is also the Anti-Money Laundering Act, National Elections Act, Political Parties Act, etc. All of this legislation is in existence, yet corruption is still very much also in existence. And I think this is due to the fact that Tanzania does not have a Right to Information Act, which would require the government to share its information with the public. Um, Because of that, there isn't much transparency in what the government really does. A very very common form of corruption in Tanzania is petty corruption. This is when underpaid officers depend on taking small but illegal payments from people just while they're doing their job. So this is an everyday thing. Um, In the courts, there's a lot of executive influence and bribery. Um, which very much influences court decisions and makes these decisions often unfair and biased. More than half of households um, have said to believe that they believe the police is corrupt, and there have also been many reports of police exemption from punishment. Um, As far as public utilities go, bribing is almost required to get the public utilities you need, like electricity, water, plumbing, and that's a big reason as to why communities like Mugatani don't have the utilities that we have in our country, in our lifestyle, um, it's because they don't really have that extra money to bribe. Over a third of households have claimed to have to offer bribes in order to get the services they need. Um, Customs administration is a very long and frustrating process that we will have to go through. Natural resources, um, government natural resource companies such as Acacia Mining have been underreporting the materials they're getting, and in that, in this sense, they're stealing from the government because they're taking um, resources from the country without anyone knowing. Um, the escrow Tegeta scandal was 
by far the worst scandal that Tanzania has seen. Basically, between 250 and 800 million dollars was transferred from the Central Bank of Tanzania and distributed illegally among government officials and two business tycoons. Um, after this got out, many people were fired and resigned due to their roles played in the scandal. Um, this includes the energy minister, the attorney general, the energy secretary, and the housing minister, um, and more. All of these people were involved, and they all resigned after this. And I want to just focus our attention on the corruption in Dodoma for a second, because this is the nearest city to us. Um, so in April this year, actually, well, last year now, the mayor of Dodoma, which is the capital of Tanzania, was actually accused of using public funds for his personal use. So this is an example of the most immediate major politician that has engaged in this activity. Um, and additionally, the president's office is located in Dodoma, and that office is at the top of the PCCB list of corrupt entities. Um, additionally, there has been a lot of uncollected revenue from vehicles. Um, so basically, they underreport how much weight and load they're carrying. So that, they, so that they can pay less at weighing bridges, and this causes lots of roads to be damaged, um, which affects us directly when we have to go into the town and are dealing with damaged roads. So this is just a quick chart of transparency, basically what were people report to know about um, the funding as far as government goes, and I think um, six on is very important in this chart because, first of all, no one knows how to report their complaints. As you can see, most of them say no, they don't know how to report corruption if they see it. Additionally, most people don't know um, about the allocation of funds to schools, and even less people know about the allocations to health facilities, which is very important to us because we're going in trying to not only provide people with water, but people with clean water. So we're concerned with the health of the community. So after the Tegeta escrow scandal, um, corruption didn't necessarily cease to exist, but it began to be cracked down upon ever since Pre President Magafuli was sworn in in 2015. He got right to business in cutting back on corruption and opacity in government. He formed special courts to deal with these corruption cases. He did unannounced visits to ministries. He pulled funding for Independence Day um, and instead put that money into anti-cholera efforts, which was a big problem at the time. Um, he started auditing public payroll, getting rid of ghost workers. He put a ban on unnecessary foreign travel for government officials. He scrapped the head of the Maine State Hospital after visiting unannounced and seeing people laying on the floor instead of on beds. And additionally, he reduced cabinet members from 30 to 19. Um, so he was really cutting back on excessiveness. Additionally, the Tanzania Revenue Authority, um, they have been stepping up with their anti-corruption efforts, perhaps um, in model of what the president was doing. It's important to note that even though Magafuli is taking all these measures to cut down on excessive spending, people are actually taking a liking to him. The hashtag what would Magafuli do has become a popular trend on social media in Africa in which people post pictures of themselves applying Magafuli's values to their daily lives by saving money in ridiculous ways. As you can see, this man decided to hitch a ride on the back of this car instead of taking a taxi home. Again, here, this person just decided to tape, tape up their car instead of taking it into the shop. Um, and here's another post. Um, this man is pretending his car broke down, and this is what he decided to use instead. When going on an implementation trip to a certain place, it's good to know about the leadership in that area and how people generally feel about the leadership and what things are changing in the government. So it's good for us to know that things will be getting better in the country because of Magafuli. Additionally, we have a partnership with Mukutani. We're not just here for this summer. Um, and so knowing all the problems that people in Mukutani face is really important for us um, when we're choosing how to help them next. Finally, we have an operations and maintenance budget. Well, the community has that budget and it's about $30 from the Congo district. So we need to make sure our maintenance repairs fall within that budget. Um, here's our work cited, and we hope you enjoyed our presentation and took a lot from it. Thank you very much.